Motorcycle Adventure Dirt Bike TV Podcast Episode 2. My name is Dave Darcy and I'm the editor-at-large of Australian Adventure Bike Magazine and tonight I'm going to read my editorial contribution from issue 13 as well as my feature titled Tropical Punch, an exploration across the top end of Australia. For those new to the Mad TV channel, the Tropical Punch video series has been very popular and has attracted over 600,000 views, so it's worth a look. My favourite in the series is a video titled Kimberly Adventure. Although this is a podcast and designed for listening, I'll provide some unedited pop footage from the bikes during the Tropical Punch series for those that want some raw adventure. My It's a Mad World editorial on page 16 of issue 13. What's the future hold? When I used to ride a heap of single trail, I would sometimes get in the zone where I felt the bike was an extension of my body. It was like we had become one, and I don't mean that in a biblical sense. There was a synergy where the bike and I were working together and every obstacle or challenge was brushed aside effortlessly. I had a heightened awareness of the effects of my input into the controls and how the bike would respond. It was as if we had both been set to autopilot. It was all so simple in those days. Throttle, clutch, brakes, tyres and suspension. Until you start to consider how your brain is processing all that information at warp speed, turning ideas into action with most of it happening subconsciously. But then these blasted computer thingies came along and motorcycles would never be the same again. Like a virus, the changes started off small. Ignition points gave way to capacitor discharge ignition, CDI, which was great as no one ever wanted to go back to points. Then came anti-lock braking, ABS, which initially may have been reasonable on the road, but were lethal on the dirt. Indelibly etched in my mind is my riding buddy Philippe's introduction to ABS on the dirt. I'll never forget the terrified look on his face as he teetered over the edge of a wily coyote-type precipice, not knowing how to turn off ABS and careering out of control at ballistic speed down one of the steepest dirt tracks in the Victorian high country on a 1200 GS weighing 275 kilograms. He hit an erosion mound so hard the top box broke off and it was thrown high into the air only to strike him in the head on the way back down. Seriously, we laughed for days. And it is available on Mad TV, that piece of video, and it still makes me laugh to this day. In recent years, motorcycle companies have latched onto this rapidly evolving technology like baby poo to a blanket. With computer power going through the roof as the cost goes through the floor, it's an efficient way to offer so many more bells and whistles. Born from a necessity to put controllable power to the ground on ridiculously powerful road bikes, the virus has spread to include traction control and active suspension, to name just a few of the new features. The cross-fertilisation of these ideas between road and adventure bikes has become seamless as the trend towards stuffing road bike engines into adventure bikes continues. And the bigger the adventure bike, the more bells and whistles it's going to have. It's a perfect storm, incursion of technology into the sanctity of simple riding pleasure driven by cashed up middle-aged blokes with nostalgic and colourfully inflated views of their riding abilities and who steadfastly believe that the bigger the bike, the better. The motorcycle companies say the technology enhances riding pleasure. The reality is the technology protects riders from themselves and their poor purchasing decisions, and in recent years has done so with spectacular success. By the looks of terror on the faces of a substantial proportion of big adventure bike riders when they confront a muddy or sandy section, it would have been wiser for them to buy something a little lighter, a little less powerful and more manageable and get their basics right. 
In this brave new world, the irony of going out and buying a 150 horsepower adventure bike is hard to overlook. You buy a big bike to show off you've got big balls, but the fly-by-wire throttle technology has severed physical connection between you and the throttle bodies. A computer chip now stands in the way of every fistful of testosterone fueled throttle action you want to make, which is really no different to losing your gonads and being pussy whipped by a microchip. And to make it worse, fly-by-wire puts the real decision making as to when and how hard the power is put to the ground in the hands of a pimply-faced white lab-coated dweeb with thick glasses pecking away on a computer. He's about as far away from the action as one of those military drone pilots blowing up crap from 10,000 kilometres away. Even worse, the engine dynamics of your bike were programmed before it was assembled. Okay, I'm sounding like a philistine, and yes, there's a heap of benefits that have come with this technology. But as technology penetrates ever deeper into the sanctity of simple riding pleasure, what have we lost? But more importantly, as technology relentlessly marches on at an ever-increasing rate, what are we going to lose next? So that was my editorial, It's a Mad World. My next reading is, again from issue 13, it's a feature article titled Tropical Punch. When an invite to ride through the most remote regions of northern Australia came his way, Australian adventure bike editor-at-large Dave Darcy didn't need to think twice before answering, I'm there and I'm bringing Nugget and a couple of Husqvarna 701s with me. You know you've been away too long with a guy like Nugget when you find yourself at a pub in a small town in northern western Australia, literally eating shit. Specifically, the kangaroo kind. Presented MasterChef style with a flourish and a smart-ass smile because Nugget knew he'd back me into a corner. It was the final day of what had proven to be an absolute epic ride and Nugget had called me out on a sure bet I'd made with him weeks earlier. There is no way the Husky Long Range will run out of fuel and if it does, I will eat kangaroo poo. I made the bet with as much certainty as wagering your house on the sun rising tomorrow. So when Nugget was towed into camp declaring he'd run out of fuel, I was speechless. As a man ever true to my word, I munched on those kangaroo droppings which stuck to my teeth like stale sayo biscuit. Of course Nugget waited until precisely this moment to tell me that actually his bike hadn't run out of fuel and it was a setup. My face said it all and Nugget did the honourable thing, quickly popping some poo into his mouth before I did it for him. Nugget and I had just spent 23 days crossing the tropical north of Australia on a pair of Husqvarna 701s. The bikes had never missed a beat and had been a perfect choice for this tough ride. On the other hand, we'd both gone a bit troppo on this massive 7,000 kilometre ride which kicked off from Cairns and had taken us almost to Derby on the far northwest coast of Western Australia before then looping back to Darwin. Even to Nugget and I, who are seasoned adventurers, there were times on this trip when adversity was real and anxiety kept you on your toes. But as is always the case, adversity makes for the most memorable moments for motorcycle adventurers. We had been asked by Craig Woodward, a.k.a. Woody, and Elise O'Connor of Elwood Motorcycle Adventures to film their Cairns to Darwin guided tour and then go exploring and filming with them in the Kimberley while they met traditional owners and negotiated exclusive access to land for future motorcycle adventures. This in itself was a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but an incredible added bonus was that Husqvarna Australia loaned us two brand new Husky 701s with some useful accessories for the journey. Rally pegs, a bash plate, alloy-backed handguards, and Nugget scored a 2020 long-range 701 with a lowering link and shorter side stand to accommodate his nuggety frame, while my mount was a 2021 standard spec. I had requested a long range kit which is available for this model but it didn't arrive in time so I'd be reliant on a fuel bladder to maintain range. 
If there was one thing good to come out of that, it was that Nugget and I were given the opportunity of experiencing both the pros and cons of the variants of the Husky 701. The Elwood Motorcycle Adventure Cairns to Darwin ride is a great tour for experienced riders right through to those wanting to taste unsupported motorcycle adventure for the first time, but do it with the security of someone who knows the area and excellent support when things turn tough. Riders carry all their camping gear, fuel, food and water. Rental Suzuki DRZ400s are available, all set up with camping gear ready to go. In the weeks and months leading up to the ride, Woody and Elise provide detailed written advice backed up with lengthy telephone calls to make sure that everyone is prepared. Woody believes a great deal of learning happens during this time for those new to the sport, particularly when it comes to advice about bike setup. Skills and experience levels of riders varied enormously on the tour. The faster riders got their dose of a decent trail pace at the front of the pack, while those new to the sport felt supported and nurtured at the back of the pack. The sweet Matt Ponting, aka Squid, was a great support. Smart on the tools, but equally adept at the motivational stuff and people skills. He's someone I'd ride with any day of the week. The group of riders for the Cairns to Darwin expedition met up early on the morning of the tour to get a little tuition on the fine art of packing At this point, Squid made a bet with the group that by the end of the day, someone's gear would be scattered from Cairns to Chilligo. As with all tours, day one is shakedown time, with riders getting to know each other both on and off the bikes. It's pretty obvious there were a bunch of strong characters on this trip. A wiry fella who could be the twin brother of Jesus and looked about the same age rocked up on a Suzuki DR650 that had a hand-built fairing. It was a handy looking job, but fortunately what looked like a large bowie knife affixed to the fairing in a scabbard ended up being a useful LED torch. Boggo, as he liked to be called, was a knowledgeable Mr. Fix-It. He had a view on any topic and he was more than willing to share his thoughts. There were the throttle jockeys, the experienced, and some with very limited off-road experience. The fleet of bikes consisted of about half rental Suzuki DRZ400s, a couple of brand new bikes on their first ride, two KTM 790s, a KTM 500 EXE, a couple of KTM 690s, a couple of DR 650s, one way thirstier than the other, and one lonesome Tenere 700, and of course Nugget and I on our fully loaded Husky 701s. The tour kicks off by heading west from Cairns through deep rainforest and then into the cattle country of the southern end of Cape York Peninsula. From there, the ride tracks along the base of the Gulf of Carpentaria and then north into Kakadu before arriving in Darwin. All up, the tour covers around 3,000 kilometres and takes 10 days. In ideal weather conditions, it's not a particularly difficult ride as it's dominated by dirt roads, tracks and twin trail that can be ridden at a good pace and further west at highway speeds comfortably. The days are broken up with many spectacular river crossings that get your heart pumping and the teamwork flowing. That said, there were many highlights and great places to visit, swim and relax. In fact, one of the strengths of this tour is that it's not all about motorcycle adventure. Spending time in Kakadu and going on a boat tour was a real highlight. However, for our tour, recent heavy rains had left day two, the Chiligo to Kurumba run, with long stretches of mud holes that certainly tested everyone. The Huskies were brilliant in these conditions, being powerful, agile and fun, But fuel anxiety was real for me as I emptied my fuel bladder into the bike in the late afternoon, knowing I would drop short of Kurumba by 40 kilometres in the dark. Fortunately, the headlight on the 2021 Husky is greatly improved over the 20 model. So Nugget, as well as Chris, who had a DRZ400 with a whopping big tank, saddled up beside me to soak up the extra candle power to watch for kangaroos as we headed into town. Needless to say, my engine conked out when my fuel load ran dry. 
I'll never forget the words as I turned to Nugget as I asked for a toe. You're more likely to get kicked to death by a duck than get a toe from me, he said. Thankfully, Chris agreed, albeit reluctantly, to give me some fuel. I switched on my headlamp to get the fuel exchange going. That was a bad move. As insects from all over Australia decided to make my every facial orifice their home, my ear holes and nostrils felt like they were being examined by a vet wearing rubber gloves. Chris was a tad cagey with his fuel, marking a line on the tank, saying that would be my allotted allowance. Nothing more, he insisted. But Nugget and I had other plans, and we distracted him so I could move the line for a more generous portion. Sorry, Chris, it just had to be done. There was a real sense of achievement as we rocked into Darwin to complete the tour. We'd seen a very decent slab of the tropical north and forged new friendships. Ali, who had limited dirt experience, summed it up pretty well. The ride was amazing, challenging at times, but that just made it all the more of an achievement. Her partner Tony added, Day two was character building. We had 12 hours on the bike, but it was great. We learned a lot from Woody and Elise about riding on gravel and sand. The run was a great tour. Jerry, who took his KTM 790 on this trip, was equally enthusiastic. That was just fantastic, he said. It's actually been a bit of a motorcycle boot camp for me. I normally plan my rides from cafe to cafe, so I'm understanding mud and sand a lot better now. I've walked away with a heap of knowledge. It was a great trip. However, for Nugget, Woody, Elise, Squid and I, we were just at the halfway point and things were about to get even more interesting. As we headed to the Western Australian border at speed, we were swallowed up in the enormity of this ancient, majestic landscape. It was very different to anything I'd seen in Australia. Huge mezzes, flat-top mountains and bluffs that stretched for tens of kilometres displayed rich ochre colours and textures in the setting sun. Wildlife trying to kill you at this hour is a far more frequent occurrence and a little more varied than the standard kangaroo, In one hour long stretch, we had near misses with brolgers, Brahma bulls, bats, wedge-tailed eagles, snakes and the odd parrot. Way out in the middle of nowhere, it was always a long distance between drinks for us and for the bikes. Fuel anxiety on my standard tanked Husky 701 was real. Even with an 8 litre giant loop fuel bladder, I regularly didn't have enough and I had to rely on others to get me over the line. In this vast land where anything can go wrong, I was uncomfortable with that. Fuel range varied from 300 to 400 kilometres depending on fuel quality, riding conditions and how heavy I was on the throttle. And believe me, on some of those open stretches I could be very heavy on the throttle. Getting 400 kilometres range was achieved by sitting at 80 kilometres for hours, which was not a happy speed for my white stallion. The low volatile fuel known as opal that is used in some communities put fuel consumption through the roof and I ran the bike to empty eight times. This experience has cemented my belief that if I were to buy a Husky 701, a longer fuel range is a must if I was to return to these areas. Meanwhile, Nugget's nemesis was tube anxiety. After his fourth flat, he would search every town and community we passed through for rubber. He became a rubber junkie. Things got pretty desperate on the freshly graded stretch of the Gibb River Road. The grading brings shoebox-sized, sharp-edged ghoulies to the surface. It seemed like every pensioner in Australia was towing a van along the Gibb River Road, and the combination of ghoulies and the dust didn't do Nugget any favours. His last flat could have spelled the end of Nugget's ride because in far northwestern Western Australia, motorcycle shops are pretty scarce and with no suitable tubes for repair, things got pretty desperate. Then in the score of the century, Indigenous elders Lance and Edna from the tiny village of Imitji saw Nugget on the side of the road and with a unique twist of kindness and generosity stopped to help him out. They drove off and a short time later, Lance came back with a 2001 Yamaha W4265F 
on the bonnet of his car. Seriously. Most importantly, the front tyre was intact. So Nugget and Squid pulled out the tube that had been in that bike since new, patched one hole, and he finished the trip on that very tube that was 20 years old. This second half of the trip was very much about Woody and Elise meeting with local Indigenous communities and negotiating access to rarely used tracks. The Gibb River Road was jam-packed with four-wheel drives and caravans, and in their quest to get off the beaten track, Woody and Elise found some trails that I would rate as some of the best riding I've done in Australia. Although the tracks can be challenging at times, it is the opportunity to be immersed in this huge and unique landscape that is the attraction for me. To put it simply, it's just great soul food, and by the end of this trip, I was emotionally obese. So there's a couple of um, other pieces that went with the pictorial, and I'll just read them out. Husqvarna 701, a cracking bike for a cracking adventure. As for the Husqvarna 701s, they just enhance the experience on this ride. They didn't miss a beat and were entirely reliable. Other than chain adjustment, the bikes never had a tool laid on them through the entire ride. Even when fully loaded with camping gear, water and additional fuel, the weight of the 701 comes in lower than most twin-cylinder bikes of similar capacity when unladen. The 701's linear engine power delivery was so useful in the very conditions, be it picking our way through rocky sections or comfortably sitting on 130 k's for hours. The engine is silky smooth and doesn't vibrate at speed, while the suspension and handling are outstanding but I would recommend ensuring static sag is within limits and upping spring rates if necessary to get the best from it when carrying additional weight. If I had my time again, the only additional modification would be a fitting of a bikini fairing to cut down the wind buffeting at high speed. Woody and Elise of Elwood Motorcycle Adventures provide a range of tours including Cairns to Darwin, Cairns to Cape York and the Victorian High Country. They will soon be announcing tours into the Kimberley with exclusive access to trails on private land. And believe me, if I had my time again, I'd return and do that Kimberley trip again. It, it really is a highlight. The country that you ride through is just absolutely magnificent. So that concludes episode two of our podcast series. There's lots more to come. I appreciate it's not everyone's cup of tea, but some just like sitting back and listening. Uh, in terms of up-and-coming rides, Nugget and I head off in a couple of days up to Gympie in Queensland on the east coast of Australia and for the Husky 701 ride. It's Husqvarna's only, so it's Norden's or 701's. And uh, what we hope to do is to give you a very authentic um, description of that ride and the people we meet. And hopefully in Nugget's Inevitable style, we'll go around and we'll look at the different setups of the 701s and Nordens uh, for those that are interested in those bikes. So see you next time for episode three. A new feature starts this Sunday. Uh, Clubby's starting Mad News, and he's going to do a new segment that goes for about 25 or 30 minutes. And so you'll get that new segment every fortnight and then every other fortnight you'll get motorcycle adventure in some form or another. So I hope you like these changes. Give us your feedback. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>